Hello and welcome to Lakes Chat. I'm your host, Jennifer Caddick with the Alliance for the Great Lakes. In today's episode, we're chatting with two Alliance staffers, Crystal M.C. Davis, our Vice President of Policy and Strategic Engagement, and Tom Zimnicki, our Director of Agriculture and Restoration Policy. Both are deeply involved in our work on agricultural pollution and the problems this pollution causes for the lakes. Today, we're chatting about Western Lake Erie, which suffers from algal blooms that are so big you can see them from space in satellite photos. These blooms pollute drinking water, threaten wildlife, close beaches for recreation, and have a direct impact on the local economy and people's pocketbooks. Welcome, Crystal and Tom. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having Thanks us. Thanks for having us, John. Yeah. So, Tom, I guess maybe let me start with you. Um, you know, even though we're at the tail end of summer, um, Western Lake Erie is still experiencing a significant algal bloom. So first recap for us on what causes this problem every year. Yeah, so uh, the bloom is largely uh, a result of excess nutrients. So those are typically coming from, from farm fields in the form of nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, and when they get to a certain concentration, we see these blooms form. Um, these have, as you mentioned earlier, you know, health impacts. Um, we also see impacts to recreation, tourism, um, as well as ecological health. Um, so there, there are a lot of contributors to it, as, as we've talked about before. I mean, certainly from like a municipality standpoint with uh, wastewater treatment plants, um, but in places like Lake Erie, uh, the dominant contributor of those of those nutrients is is agriculture. And give us a little update on what you've seen this summer and what it looks like now out on the lake. And so this summer, uh, you know, the the NOAA and kind of the experts to be would classify this year as, as a mild bloom compared to other years. Um, you know, I think at this point in time, we've kind of gotten to the point where it, it's not about like, are we going to see a bloom? It's our, it's what size is the bloom going to be? So we've kind of gotten to this point, unfortunately, where I think the public, the research community, the advocacy community, we've gotten to the point where it's just something that we anticipate and expect to happen. And, you know, I think for a lot of folks who don't live around Western Lake Erie, sadly, this issue has become a little bit of old news, mm -hmm. um, but it has a direct impact on the people who live there, work, play, recreation, recreate. Um, Crystal, can you paint a picture for our listeners about how this impacts people day to day? Absolutely. I think we are a very crisis responsive uh, citizenry. So um, nothing was more glaring than the Toledo water crisis in 2014, where uh, Toledo and woke up that morning to uh, warnings of being able to not drink their water. And so that was the moment that it was glaringly apparent for everyone. But if you live um, near Lake Erie, it could be something as simple as a beach closure where you just can't recreate on the lake that day. But then it could be some, it could also have a dire impacts like health impacts, like Tom just talked about with not being, being able to drink the water or for people who um, depend on Lake Erie for their job and their workforce, um, it could be not be, it could impact our fisheries mm -hmm. and their livelihood as well. Um, and so lots of impacts and impacting folks daily in different ways. Yeah, and I think one thing that that I forget about, but sometimes on social media you see, you see pictures like this is up on the shore. I mean, it's out in the lake, right? But it's on the shore, you know? So, and it, um, somebody described it once as like it, it smells like your grandma's attic, like it's musky and yucky. And, you know, when you think about that on your, in your town and then in your drinking water, that's really concerning and I think would be really disturbing for a lot of folks. Absolutely. It's going to affect tourism, um, especially during the pandemic where folks really weren't um, traveling via plane to go somewhere. They wanted to go somewhere locally. Uh, mm -hmm. But do you want to go to the place that has, uh, you know, water that looks like split pea soup? Probably not. And so it can definitely affect tourism, which affects our bottom line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And, you know, we've talked, touched on this a little bit, but, you know, these blooms, they're not always toxic, but they can sometimes be toxic. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, as you mentioned, Crystal, back in 2014, the Toledo area was without drinking water for almost three days because of toxins from that bloom got into their drinking water supply. And that wasn't a standalone event. It's happened in other communities in Western Lake Erie. Um, and, you know, making sure that those toxins don't get into drinking water has a real cost. And so this year, Tom, you and your team led the development of a report that looked at those downstream costs um, that, you know, the, the cost that communities are paying to make sure drinking water coming out of the taps in their home is safe. So what are some of the top line findings from that report? Yeah, so, um, you know, like you said, there there are uh, hidden costs with being able to adequately monitor for and treat, you know, algal blooms and, and harmful algal blooms. And so the, what we found uh, is that, you know, a family of five in Toledo is paying nearly $100 more a year um, just for costs associated with um, keeping that drinking water safe uh, from harmful algal blooms. And so that that is uh, aside from everything else that goes into their water bill and the drinking water bill. Um, and then we found like within kind of the Lake Erie Basin, the Western Lake Erie Basin as a whole, um, those costs are a little bit lower uh, from what we found a little closer to like $50 a year for a family. Um, but still like a significant cost, especially, and in the case of Toledo, uh, a fairly significant co cost considering that uh, those problems and the source of that problem is largely generated far upstream from Toledo itself and the ratepayers within that community. Yeah, and I, you know, one thing that I always want to stress with this is that water treatment plan, you know, the, the folks who manage all of these different water supplies are working really hard mm -hmm. <laughs> to make sure that these toxins don't get in into drinking water. You know, they want to make sure that everybody has safe water coming out of their taps. And so, Tom, what are some of the things that water treatment plants are having to pay extra for? Like, what exactly are they paying for? Yeah, so there's there's a cost associated with monitoring. So monitoring to see if that bloom is in fact toxic, but also where the bloom is in relation to the water treatment plant and the intakes. Um, they're having to pay for uh, the treatment of blooms and of harmful algal blooms. And so there, there are different technologies that you can use and different chemical processes that you can use to treat those blooms. Um, and then what you then have to do with the blooms after you treat it. So it's, you know, algal blooms, right, are, are matter, right? So after they get done, after we are treating them and we filter them through the system, we have to get rid of that material. And so there's a cost associated with moving that material to some sort of disposal facility. Got it. Jen, I think it's important to also note that uh, the water treatment plants weren't made to last forever. Mm -hmm. And so we have an aging water infrastructure as well that needs mm -hmm. to be updated, which is why we are so excited about the bipartisan infrastructure law and the funding that's going to that effort, because mm -hmm. we need to pay. Um, now we have a little bit more relief and a little bit more help, but we still have a water infrastructure problem in the United States and especially in the Midwest. And so that's another one of those costs that are passed down. A lot of times we talk, and with this report in particular, we talked about $100. And initially, um, when you're in D.C. talking about this with legislators, $100 is brunch in D.C. I know that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'll also say that there are a lot of families that are struggling to make ends meet on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And $100 represents um, a number of prescriptions that could have been filled, that were left unfilled, food being put on the table paying for children's um, school fees and field trips and things of that nature. Families are making economic trade-offs mm -hmm. for a problem that they did not create. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and to that point, Crystal, right? Like what you mentioned earlier. So it's, yes, there are these hard costs associated with monitoring and treatment and disposal, but then there are also those costs of if your job depends on being able to be on or near the water for tourism or recreation or whatever it is, um, then then that might be in another form of lost income 
if you have to cancel boat tours for that day or if you have to cancel opening up the the convenience store right that's like next to it that's selling ice cream cones so so there there are a lot of other costs associated with this that the report didn't capture and that um but are very real to people living in the area yeah i think that's a those are powerful points and i think Crystal, there's also the, um, which we've talked about with some of our partners, sort of the emotional cost, right? Like that experience in Toledo was really terrifying for community members, you know, because it wasn't just that you couldn't drink the water, like you weren't supposed to shower, you couldn't have the restaurant open. Hospitals were worried about where they were going to get water from for life-saving treatment, right? And all the things that a hospital has to do to run. And so, you know, could you give us a sense of sort of how communities are you know still kind of reeling from from those disasters and this ongoing fear of this potential problem. Yeah, there's a lot of post traumatic stress associated with um, the algae bloom forecast that happens every June uh, in Ohio. Where you know for people who don't live in the Northwest Ohio area, it's like okay, they're going to do the algae bloom forecast. And just like Tom said, at this point, it's not a question of whether there will be a bloom or not, it's how toxic or how big it's gonna be. Mm. But for folks in Toledo, it is very serious. They are really worried about aging water infrastructure and water contamination. Um, when we talk about the Toledo water crisis, typically we think about, oh, they turned on their water, just like we're seeing in Jackson right now, they turned on their water and the water was not drinkable. But for so many, it was deeper than that. And being able to meet with our partners to learn more about that um, was very enlightening. There were uh, young people who really depended on their jobs at Starbucks and other places because they contributed to their family's income and they weren't allowed to go to work. They weren't permitted to go to work. Um, people couldn't brush their teeth. There were senior citizens who were place bound. And for so many of us, it was like, oh, well, they can go to nearby places and buy water water wasn't available. There were seniors that couldn't get to Detroit and other areas to go buy water. And they had started to make their coffee that morning um, because it was muscle memory. And so they are very um, impacted by that incident. Even though it was 2014, they're still impacted by it today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Once that, that kind of unspoken trust that when you turn on your tap, and everything's you're going to get clean water once that doesn't happen you you think about it so much more for right. sure so you know tom to my knowledge this is the first time anybody's tried to take a comprehensive look at least the costs that we can quantify right um related to the downstream treatment um how did you go about like where did you get this information how did you go about compiling it yeah, so, you know, to their credit, the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency, um, their division of drinking and groundwater uh, actually collected this information through a survey method with, with uh, public water supplies in the region to understand what the cost of HABs are that, that those facilities are incurring. And so what we did was we, we kind of got wind, frankly, of, of the, that survey had happened. And so we requested the data um, from OEPA, which uh, what we did was was really aggregate it, but also look at it specifically within the Lake Erie Basin. So they the the department had surveyed statewide, um, and so we're obviously really focused on the Lake Erie watershed. And so we did not generate new data, um, but we compiled the data in a way that is more usable and more relatable for residents in the region. And what did you identify in this report and, and the team that worked on it with you as next steps for the state of Ohio? Yeah, so um, you know, one of the big things is it was, it was not intuitive on how to find this data and then what to do with the data once we got it. Um, and so part of what we're asking for moving forward is, is as this information is collected, that it needs to be uh, packaged in such a way that it's digestible for residents. But before we get to that point, we, we have to continually collect this information. And so what's important to note is that the, the data that we used was really just a snapshot in time. Um, and so based on how severe an algal bloom is, 
is going to dictate some of the costs that a water treatment plant is going to incur. Um, if a bloom is, is really prolonged, um, if it is widespread, um, the costs for monitoring are, are going to go up, the cost of treatment, the cost of disposal. So in the year that this information was collected, um, you know, wasn't necessarily representative of the last 10 years. So getting continual and regular information um, and then aggregating that at the state level for, for citizens to be able to understand how algal blooms are impacting their build. And we also know, I think that's a really interesting point that it was just like one year, right? So this yeah. bloom changes from year to year. We also know that climate change, mm -hmm. right, is potentially going to make this problem worse, mm -hmm. which potentially means more money down the line, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, earlier when you asked, you know, what's what drives the blooms, I mean, part of it in Lake Erie, right, is is the depth of Lake Erie. It's it's a warmer area of the lake compared to some of the other Great Lakes. So as climate change continues to have an effect on the region and the world, um, we expect blooms to continue to get worse as a result of that. You know, and Crystal, I know we've talked about this and Tom too, but um, I guess this question is for you is, you know, we have these downstream people who are literally paying for this pollution problem. Um, did they have a seat at the table in decision making around how to fix this problem, the programs that are being worked on to stop or limit this kind of pollution? Um, do they have a seat at the table, particularly because they're paying for it, but they didn't really cause the problem. Short answer, no. <laughs> no, they don't have a seat at the table. I mean, we're fighting to make sure that there are equitable, there is equitable stakeholder engagement um, and really educate lawmakers and the administrations in various states across the region on what that really means. It's not posting a public meeting and then saying you have to travel an hour to get there during work hours um, and then just be in listen mode um, or a solicitation to just write comments on some wonky report that laymen really won't understand. It's being able to um, have meetings that are transactional where people can really weigh in before policies are set um, that come with um, frequently asked questions and fact sheets in various languages and um, are accessible at different times of day. There are a lot of people who really care about these issues and this is not their nine to five. And so being able to access a meeting virtually or in the evening or small, small group meetings in uh, various parts of the state could really be beneficial. Partnering with community groups would be beneficial. So this is an ongoing conversation that we're having with um, our governors and legislatures across the region to really make sure that uh, we have a diverse set of people at the table because there is not right now. And, you know, for both of you, uh, you know, first talking about Ohio and then narrow or not narrowing, making this a little bit bigger. Um, you know, what's next for this issue in Ohio? You know, I know there are some big steps coming up over the next six to 12 months. Mm -hmm. Right now, the state is in the process of developing and finalizing a, a TMDL. So a TMDL is a is very simply a, like a pollution diet for the lake. And so it's how much pollution, how much, how many nutrients can we put into the water and the water still maintain its usability. And so this came about through a very long uh, legal process and, and a lot of public comment and input. Um, the state's in, in I would say somewhat of the final stages of, of finalizing this document, um, which they're, I think, planning to release in January or February of 2023. Um, so the Alliance is, along with a lot of other regional and state partners, have been engaged throughout the development of that document and that plan. Um, so weighing in on some of the technical information, weighing in, as Crystal said, on how do they, you know, how can the state better increase stakeholder engagement um, and, and community buy-in for this plan. Um, so that's kind of next steps as it relates to Ohio and, and Lake Erie. 
Yeah, I think the other thing I would add is that we applaud Governor DeWine. He's been focused on Lake Erie from day zero um, during his campaign. He talked about Lake Erie. And one of the things that he did um, once in office was create the H2 Ohio program, uh, a $172 million initial investment in addressing um, agricultural runoff. And so we're there's a sizable amount of money going towards making sure that um, the agriculture community um, has access to those best management practices that reduce phosphorus in Lake Erie. And so one of our uh, priorities, especially in Ohio, is making sure we get long-term funding for that program so that it stays uh, intact and has an even uh, more increased impact in the lakes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Good point. And broadening this out a little bit, you know, Western Lake Erie, I think, is is in some ways the poster child for this problem. It certainly is the biggest problem. Just so such a huge area impacted with these algal blooms that are caused by runoff from agricultural lands. You know, but this isn't limited to, to Lake Erie, right? Other parts of the lakes, Green Bay, et cetera, have this problem um, or variations on the theme. And, you know, as we step back a little bit, um, you know, Tom, maybe I'll start with you and then Crystal, you can chime in. What tools do we have in the toolbox to fix or, or start to uh, alleviate this big problem of agri agricultural pollution? Yeah. So, uh, unfortunately, there isn't one tool or one solution to all of this. And so, what what we see and what we know we need in whether it's Lake Erie or any other water body in, in the region, there needs to be a mix of, of regulatory mechanisms. There needs to be the adequate appropriations and and how those and a plan for how to spend those dollars effectively. There needs to be um, some ability to incentivize different behaviors from landowners and land operators. Um, and there also needs to be kind of back to what we were talking about with from a, uh, from a ratepayer standpoint, we, we need to recognize that that right now we are externalizing these costs to downstream communities and other people in these states. And so having a really serious conversation about how do we address that affordability issue um, from pollution that's generated all around these municipalities. So there's, you know, we we can, and Jen, I think in our first podcast, we got into some of like the social dynamics at play. And, and I think there's also, you know, I'd be remiss to not point out that like there are a lot of other things from an agricultural standpoint that like consumers probably need to change. There's a lot of we need to kind of rethink our food system as a whole and, and how we have structured the food system over the last 40, 50 years. Um, that in itself could be a whole couple podcasts, so we won't get into it. But I just wanted to like, there, there's a lot out there that we can and, and need to be using uh, to get at these issues. Yeah, I'll just add that, you know, there are folks that are involved on the legal aspects of this too. Yep. And so uh, using our legal tools is important um, in addition to legislation and having legislative advocates who are at the state houses making sure that they're implementing policies and putting forth proposals that really um, protect the lakes and that we do our job to hold them accountable um, to this work. And so those are in addition to all of the things that Tom outlined. Yeah, and we can uh, relink to the conversation you and I had, Tom, last year on season one of Lakes Chat, where we kind of talked bigger picture about like the whole context and, you know, agribusiness as a whole. And there's so much there. Um, yeah, we could probably talk for a couple hours, but uh, we won't do that today. <laughs> um, you know, the, the Alliance has started investing a lot in sort of staffing up on this issue. Um, we've added Tom in the last year, um, not in this conversation, as Sarah Walling, who works, she's based in Wisconsin, who's working on this issue. Um, you know, so so what's on your agenda? What, what's next for us on these issues? So we're going to continue to work on these big pictures or these like kind of bigger regional issues. So places like Lake Erie. Uh, Green Bay, Saginaw Bay, up in the th thumb of Michigan. I mean, some of these like kind of big priority watersheds. But 
the staffing and, and our new capacity is really going to allow us to dig in on more state level issues as well. Um, you know, Crystal has a ton of background and experience in the state of Ohio, understands that landscape really well. Um, my my career before joining the Alliance was based almost entirely out of Michigan and, and environmental policy there. And Sarah spent 15 plus years at the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture. So she understands that landscape really well, too. So we we really want to and we were really intentional about kind of how we staffed up in order to be able to dig in on these state level issues. So yes, things like Lake Erie, but also how how are we protecting groundwater for drinking wells in Wisconsin or in Michigan? And those are things that, you know, yes, some of those things are also maybe gonna have an impact on the picture in Lake Erie, but more immediately, the, the types of programs and policies that we can push for uh, hopefully we'll have more immediate impacts on everyday people living in some of these landscapes. And so we're really excited to, you know, over the next several years, really dig into opportunities there. Yeah, I think I'll add that our additional capacity um, is really given us the bandwidth to be able to work more collaboratively with partners as well. Mm -hmm. um, when we had a smaller ag team, we could only be in so many places at once, but now we're able to do a little bit more of the education work that uh, we see that legislators and communities need as well. And so we're working collaboratively with partners and especially our frontline partners to make sure that we're uh, amplifying voices of impacted communities and um, making sure that we're developing longer and deeper relationships with our legislatures and uh, governor's offices on these issues as well. Yeah. Think, well, oh, go Crystal, ahead, Tom. I, Crystal's just glad she didn't have to drive up to the thumb of Michigan and <laughs> all over Wisconsin anymore. I'm down to come anytime, anytime. <laughs> but I'm so glad to have you and uh, Sarah, <laughs> staff. For that <laughs> We love all parts of the Great Lakes, but it is certainly a big area to cover. So, Tom, uh, Crystal, thank you so much for this conversation today. Um, and for our listeners, you can find out a lot more information at greatlakes.org slash lakeschat. We'll put up some resources there. We'll also relink to our conversation last year we had with Tom that gets into some of the bigger picture context on all of this. So thank you so much again, Tom and Crystal. Yeah, thanks, Jen. Thank you.